The Koi Gig Pod and OTB Sports in association with Cadbury. A player and a half deserves a glass and a half of support. Everyone ran their socks off tonight and they left everything out there. They're very proud of the, the team's performance. Let the shackles off Katie a bit so that she can go and play her game. We're going to go out there to beat them. We're going to try and beat them. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Koi Gig podcast. We're coming to you after a very exciting night. Uh, Count 11 nil. What What is there to say? <laughs> Where can yeah. we go from here? I don't know. I've, I've never been on the commentary side of the fence when there's been a result like this. I feel like I've always been such a, a moaning Michael and really picking apart the performances. But it was just one of those nights where look, we're playing up against a very, very poor Georgian team. They were even short, but but at that, Ireland put in an excellent performance. I think it was kind of the bounce effect of the poor performance in the Slovakia game. I think the girls really just had the bit between their teeth. And once the record to, was on, I think once they got that kind of fifth and sixth goal, they kind of were being buoyed by the crowd. There was um, a decent crowd considering the conditions and they were screaming for the 10th and then the 10th and 11th came, which was unbelievable. And some really positive performances, which were needed after a, a poor Slovakia turnout. Definitely. I saw a lot of people on Twitter being like, good to know that the double digits work on the like scoreboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't see too many of them. Um, to be fair, we didn't make it the last time at Montenegro in Tala. You'll remember it was uh, a couple of campaigns ago. It was a much sunnier evening, if I remember well. And um, Anya Gorman and Stephanie Roach both got themselves hat-tricks that day and both still going strong, which is testament to them a couple of campaigns later. Um, but look, there's new, there's new stars on the block there tonight. The likes of Denise O'Sullivan, who obviously we know so well, she got herself a hat trick, which is massive for her, going second in the top goal scoring list as well, behind the one and only Livio Till. I don't know if that record will ever be caught, but um, great for her, great for Katie again, because I know there are people who were kind of looking at their performances the other night. For me, it wasn't their performances, it was the setup and just players not knowing what to do in that formation that Vera brought forward from the Finland game in a completely different type of game against Slovakia, um, a game where there was a lot more ebbing and flowing and it was a bit more open and we were just a little bit caught wanting, I thought, tactically in that game. Hmm. Well, you're, of course, listening to episode five of the podcast. I can't believe we're at the five mark. It's a bit mad. Um, the Koi Gig Pod is OTB's home of everything WSL and women's football. We're obviously here directly in the wake of a very historic night against Georgia. So we will be spending most of the podcast chatting about that, especially since there isn't any WSL at the weekend past. I'm Kathleen McNamee and with me as ever is Ireland International and Piedmont United's Karen Duggan. The Koi Gig Pod on O2B Sports is in association with Cadbury FC, official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland women's national team. Later we'll have a very well, I hope a very interesting chat for everyone, uh, a goalkeeping deep dive, a topic that many people are always questioning in the women's game in particular with all round Ireland legend Emma Byrne. But so is Karen like... Uh, I was I was thinking back to the Slovakia game. I think it was Emma actually when she was doing the commentary. She predicted a four nil win, and in my head today going into this game, I was like, I feel a four nil win would be kind of fair. But then I was almost worried to think it or say it after the result last week, and I don't think eleven nil like wash where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, there was a, just a lot of factors to it. Um, I think that. The girls who came into the team made a big difference. I think that games where we have possession, um, we need players who on the pitch who really know how to navigate the spaces really well. And for me, Rusha Littlejohn was key to that. I thought she should have been brought on at halftime or I know Vera said maybe because she hasn't had much game time um, in the WSL. That was her reason for not starting her. But it was a game where we needed to kind of pick locks and and just be patient on the ball and show some composure and we didn't have that until she came on the pitch I didn't feel um so I think that she was definitely a welcome addition today I think she had a calming influence um Meg I think that helped Megan in the center we saw her in a lot more ball than what we we saw against Slovakia and it's key to have those midfield players um, creating space for Denise O'Sullivan who then we saw when she was given that free role to kind of roam in behind the midfield and she wasn't too overly worried about her defensive responsibilities she was able to find spaces in the box and that's where we want her finding spaces and of course it was a game where we were able to we actually pushed our 
centre backs on a lot, which pushed our wing backs on. There was no way you'd call them wing backs today. I think the corner <laughs> forward would be a better description for them today. They were so high. But then that allowed them to get crosses into the box. And we saw Katie were banging on that door to get Katie McCabe higher up the pitch for so, so long. But it's been the second campaign now, and it's still not really happening. It's still technically a wing back today. But when she's in those wide areas higher up the pitch, her delivery is one of the best in the world, certainly in Europe. Um, so it was great for that. And then Jess Zhu, you know, another a women's National League representative, it was great to see her getting on the pitch. And she really kept the width as well in that created space. And I thought Kira and Lucy worked well in the pockets then as well. So there's a lot of positives. And I did think it comes down to picking the right personnel for your for- formation. And I think that's what we got wrong against Slovakia. Mm, every time Katie got anyway high up in the pitch, I was like, Karen will be happy. She'll be <laughs> no, I was especially happy because her goal came from a central position where she actually drifted in from the right wing. I was like, hmm, that's the number 10 position. I wonder, has anyone has anyone ever had that novel idea that we might she might operate very well in there? Um, like no, but like we know back on the archive of the yeah, yeah. Uh, someone mentioned. might have said it somewhere. Yeah. Um <laughs> yeah, no, I I I understand Vera's standpoint in that she is getting all these accolades from Arsenal for playing in that position. But like I say, we don't have the same attack and talent that they do. But we do have very good defenders. And we saw today Diane Caldwell came back in for Savannah McCarthy. She's one of the most experienced players on the team. We have plentiful options. Anya Gorman made way for Jess Sue today. She's been used as, as a defender. So she could do a job there. I, I, I'm happier with a, a left back who'll do a job and maybe won't be bombing up and down and 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 so like world class like goals. but I want my 10 doing that I want my my more advanced players being the ones who are like getting their shots off causing havoc putting the opposition and center backs under pressure that's where we got success against Finland because we actually just kind of broke out of those positions a little bit and caught them cold a little bit by our pressing game and we didn't do that against Slovakia and I just think that there there is definitely still scope to change out of that formation or particularly if she's going to stick with that formation change in where she places players in particular Katie. Definitely I was thinking it was the sort of team that Emma would have loved from her team of the week where they're always very attack minded. I know yeah <laughs> she would have had her <laughs> fill there because I actually don't even think um, Louise I had to go back into her half because Courtney was kind of sweeping up there. Um, Neve Fahey was up in, in the box putting herself about um, as well. And Diane was letting off Raspers. She nearly got herself on the score sheet as well, which I know she would have loved on her return. But I think she kind of set the tone as well from the first minute. She pinged a ball, skipped Louise, it went across to Neve Fahey and just kind of was very confident in her play around the back, but also composure which we lacked against Slovakia but yeah there was there was intent the first goal kind of came from quick thinking Nifa he quick freak quick throw in um so yeah I think that they, there was definitely just the girls decided today that this was their day to show that they actually can play because they did come in for criticism and rightly so but I also think that it, it brought us back to putting the beer under the spotlight again because we didn't practice playing against teams like Slovakia in our lead up to this campaign and we've yeah. shown that we still struggle against those kind of medium teams who are at our own level. And that's the kind of rock we we perished on in, in the Euro campaign against the Ukraine and Greece. So we have an opportunity to put it right. We do play them again. We're still in pole position um, for that second place, given that we had that brilliant result against Finland. But it'll be very hard to replicate that result against Finland. So we need to be ensuring that it's a clean sweep against the likes of Georgia and Slovakia from now on. Yeah, definitely. I want to give everyone just like a little roll call of honour of all the people who did actually score tonight. So quite an impressive mm. list. And I, I had to write it all down because I was like, there's no way I'm going to remember this off the a top. A sheet is just nice. Usually it's a post-it note. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> We had a Denise Sullivan hat trick. I think uh, Risha Littlejohn after the match was kind of hinting that Katie McKay's mum might have been picking out uh, <laughs> the match rather. Yeah, than... Denise would have gotten my vote to be fair. And um, just getting a hat trick is, is something so rare in international football and it really needs to be highlighted um, how good that was. Um, I know Katie got the assists and she got player of the match. But for me, Denise getting that from midfield, it's 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 so positive and and she's so deserving of that second place on that role of honor because no one works harder than Denise O'Sullivan. <laughs> no, we've we've all seen no the key maps to show when she gets <laughs> run in those matches. I get tired just watching her half yeah. the time. Obviously, too from Katie McCabe. 
again, her deliveries were great. It was just so obvious that she had the measure of every single Georgian yeah. player who went near her, even with ball at feet. She was so great. Yeah, that's and a then- good point. I think everyone did. I think everyone had that confidence that they were better than the opposition. And for some reason, we didn't show that against Slovakia. So I hope now they realise that when they do play, that they can. They can just go at teams a bit more now. But I do need to just be coached in that kind of transitionary period but in terms of their attack and play they know they can do it so it's just being a bit more mindful on those transitions yeah because it wasn't a match in any sense where Ireland needed to hold a shape where they needed yeah. to make sure that they were defending well I don't even remember did Courtney get it maybe one touch in the second half I she remember got she maybe a touch came. sweeping but she was near yeah. the halfway line yeah and like she came I don't think she had a kick out. Yeah. where she came really far up yeah and we already had a few people back and I was like Courtney no <laughs> don't she, she was like, perished like it was free yeah. I love her. I not a night for the goalkeepers um and then one for Kira Caruso great to see her in the squad we've seen her in the Champions League and doing really really well Lucy Quinn Tiersha Noonan Amber Barrett Megan Conley and then obviously the early own goal as well so it's a really nice roll call of players as well I think just for confidence going into the next stage you know it's not just Katie scoring a screamer or Louise getting a last minute header yeah or a set piece and yeah yeah there was a variety to it there's a variety of scores and yeah, like I can only I can only imagine what it's like to score for your country, given that I never did it. But um, I think that that'll really, yeah, it's going to be brilliant for them, as particularly the girls who came off the bench. Who you know, it's hard going into those camps and, and feeling like you're not going to get many minutes. But this game, they give them the opportunity to come in and actually make a meaningful impact, and that'll do them the world of good. So it, you could go into the Christmas break or go back to your club where maybe you're not playing that much. Obviously, we're on a break in the Women's National League as well. And you might think, oh, I'll take the foot off the pedal. Where's the point? I'm not really getting a look in anyway. But those mm-hmm. little things, here she getting that goal. I know it was two yards out, but she'll be buzzing to get back again. She'll want more. That's what goal scorers do. Amber Barrett, similarly, um, you could kind of see how much she enjoyed that goal. A little bit too much in terms of... <laughs> I wasn't a big fan of the Ronaldo celebration, but I was delighted. I don't for think her you were the well. only one. There was a lot. No. There was a lot of <laughs> But that's Amber. That's her personality, and it was nice yeah. for her to be able to to get that apart. And there was a bit of crack, but um, it'll do her the world of good, and she'll be she'll be buzzing going back now to to um. We spoke to her. It's sometimes it can be difficult and it can be hard when you're not, not getting your game, but to come on and score an international goal like there's no better feeling. Did you approve of Lucy's celebration any more than the last time we were talking to her? Well, it couldn't have got much worse, so we'll say that. I think that um, it, it's it's obvious that we haven't had too many 11 win, nil wins. The celebrations still need, they need work, but um, that's a good complaint to have. Yeah, no, definitely. And if they want to practice some more in the new year, we will happily oh, have Oh, I don't mind if they practice that against Slovakia now. <laughs> <laughs> have that yeah. same list going against Slovakia. Yeah, no, it would be it'd be nice to have a few more. I don't think I've ever actually watched like an Irish sports match, especially well, especially soccer, I suppose, and just felt this overwhelming sense of we're going to win this and we're going to win this well, like even well before Georgia had the player sent off. It was just so obvious that we were yeah. well ahead of where they were. And I suppose that is something to touch on as well, because we as are 90 as, places ahead of them in the rankings. Yeah, this as is, much as this we're, is an expected result. Obviously, it was really good performance, but off the back of a poor result, I think that something like this, it settles us back and we can go back to talking about progress and we can go back to saying, what can we take from this performance and, and bring it forward into the into the new year, into the friendlies, and they'll hopefully, hopefully get us ready for the rest of the campaign. But yeah, you're, you're right in what you're saying there, definitely. Yeah, because for me tonight's great and it's really fun and obviously I had a great time celebrating it but it didn't really ease any of the concerns I have when it comes to the Slovakia game and what we went a bit like what you were saying earlier Mm -hmm. the fact that we come up against these teams who are kind of similar level of where we are and we still stumble as tonight was an expected was maybe not 11-0 but we expected to score a good few goals against them and it is really great for all these players to get on the score sheet but at the same time it is going to take a bit of work and it, it's important, I suppose, not to get carried away entirely by it. No, Tomorrow, I'm, tonight, uh, yeah, can... I'm actually glad that there is this gap now before the next game, because you're right. I do think there is a lot of work to do. I think they didn't look like they were coached 
in those transitions in how to cover each other very well like I know Vera was kind of looking at Katie's role in the goal because she had pushed on an infield but for me that was the right position it was that the rest of the midfielders had been dragged so far wide and then we had three centre backs if you have three centre backs one of them one of them can cover across you know mm. and that's it's not a system that a lot of them will be playing at their club so if you're is going to insist on playing this system again with those players she needs to really work with them and, and just make sure it's drilled into them so there's a bit of time now and there'll be friendlies that they can use for that I'd like to see the friendlies change the change the system and possibly change the personnel I'd like to find a system that suits our players uh, utilizes our Katie McCabe's and our Denise O'Sullivan's to their best for the Irish team and I think that there is definitely still scope for that. Mm. Obviously we have our stalwarts, we have our Denise O'Sullivan's, Katie McCabe's, we have Quinn's but there was a few new faces, a few faces haven't got a lot of game time on the squad tonight. Who was the person out of all those that kind of stood out the most for you or who do you think made the best impression for like, I deserve a spot? Again, with the knowledge that this is Georgia and it was 11-0. Yeah, like. I think um, Jess Sue didn't do herself any um, injustice there. I thought she was really positive when she got on the ball. She will have a lot harder tests, but she showed positivity. Or Her first touch was always forward and she was willing to take on players. So that's good. And I think that she'll definitely be a very good option should we go back to a four in midfield where we use out and out wingers I wouldn't have her as a wing back against a team like Finland or Sweden I think that she's mm -hmm. never played in defense and I wouldn't put that on her the one that I was really happy to see get on the pitch as well because she's been doing so well in America and she used to be in the squad when I was there and she's a great player she's technically really good and she is like Rusha Littlejohn one of those players who can kind of create combination plays and kind of make something from nothing she creates space where you don't think there is some and I think she could bounce really well off Denise um, and that is Roman McLaughlin so she's kind of been on the periphery for a while. She's getting all these accolades in America. So I was looking for her to get a chance to get on the pitch. And luckily she did. And again, she was good in those combos. Obviously, everyone was good. Likewise, Kira Grant. But I was really happy to see her get on the pitch because I think in games where we are struggling to kind of get those combination plays, she's someone who has that kind of game intelligence and that willingness to get on the ball and try and create. So really, really happy to see her get on the pitch. And I thought Kira did well. You know, we can't be dependent on Heather for everything. So I thought she worked really hard, um, Kira Caruso up top. So uh, yeah, a lot of positivities from the girls who haven't been getting a huge amount of game time. Yeah, definitely. I think the resounding message is a night for celebrations, but also we won't get entirely carried away before. Yes. I almost feel like I'm talking about the Irish men's rugby team when they do something yeah, like that. Yeah. And I'm like, peaking well, before the World like, Cup. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> At least we're halfway through the campaign and we're in that second spot that we are coveting. So mm -hmm. long way to go. But look, we have we have we'll say one finger on it at the moment. So let's try and get the full grasp of it in the new year. Definitely. And one thing as well, just to touch on, obviously don't have any WSL this week, but the Ballon d'Or was given out yesterday. Mm. Uh, Barcelona's and Spain's, I suppose, tell us, won it. Everyone knew she was going to win it. Yeah. I don't think it was I really mean, that surprising. 26 best player, best team. Yeah. The right way a winner should be won. I know there's more controversy with the men's, but for me, the best player on the best team is, is the obvious pick. And she was and absolutely deserving of her Ballon d'Or. Yeah, I thought one of the more interesting things almost came from like when you went down the list a little bit, like Sam mm. Kerr being third and then Frank Kirby being 10th. I was like, there seems to be like, and that seems to happen quite a lot with those two because Sam Kerr is so well known across so many different continents, probably. And Frank Kirby is very English European based, but she always seems to get left slightly down the list. And I remember this even when we were doing um, ESPN did a list of the top 50 players. And again, people were ranking Frank Kirby really low. And I was like, you guys are. Yeah, I think you you're right. I think it has to do with the amount of like, that's still a feature of the women's game where we mistake publicity and attention for progress like we see that with our own women's team sometimes we're like god the girls must have come on loads and loads but they're just getting more and more attention we've ha had class pairs for a long time um but that is an interesting point of view definitely because she is more internationally renowned she's she's the big name player she's the expensive player whereas frank kirby kind of worked her way up drank she's always been held in high regard there um but yeah, that's that's a really good point. So I think that's something to kind of keep an eye on as the years go by. Is it going to be based on on the big names or is it going to be based on who we know? I think as people get to know these these girls more and more, um, it will level the playing field. But 
no controversy in this the winner at least which is always good yeah, but yeah the, the list is interesting if you scrutinize it in that way yeah it definitely is and like, that's something I suppose that came up in 2019 as well when Megan Rapino won and like she had a great world cup six goals golden boot shared with Alex Morgan and Ellen White was it that year yeah 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 Ellen White uh who again we should mention broke Kelly Smith's record tonight yeah like, huge 20 achievement. nil result for yeah. England against Latvia bit mad but I remember when she won it, she barely played for the Megan Rapino that she barely played for her club that season. And again, it was because she had appeared to have a good on world a big cup. stage, yeah. Yeah, the on a big stage that gets publicity. Yeah, yeah. Same with kind I, of Alex Morgan this year and her kind of nod for a few awards. I think that there was a couple eyebrows raised among people who, like you said, they would have a good knowledge of of the broader leagues and and the the community of fantastic players there. So, um, yeah, it's it's. It certainly can be in favour of those, particularly the American players who are the kind of talisman for women's soccer across the world. They're, they're the big stars. They're the ones who've always been ahead of the men. Um, so you can kind of see where it does come from in a way. Yeah. Make it right, but you can see where it comes from. Yeah, no, definitely. I, and I also know as well with the way voting works for these things sometimes as well people there can be someone who is like consistently quite near the top and then they'll just not make it and someone mm. will slightly pip them and everyone will get really annoyed and I talk about this from my own experience yeah. <laughs> <At the end. laughs> you're looking at it and you're like oh I wish I could fudge these numbers but I can't well I'd say Robert Lewandowski would agree with you as well on that one <laughs> um, yeah I think that he's a couple of years now he's he's been in with the shout as well so um it's nice to see there's equality in that way <laughs> I, I did love as well the equality in the inequality like, yeah we'll just make up an award for Lewandowski oh, <laughs> we so we'll just make up something I also thought it was great as well and um, credit to her that Emma Hayes when Chelsea won the club award very much said I wish my girls could be here right now because obviously the award ceremony was held during an international break the only players that did attend were the five Barcelona players Barcelona chartered a flight for them Lika Martins is injured so she wasn't going to be playing with the Netherlands anyways and then Ashley Lawrence was in PSG and not going to Canada for well actually their match was in Mexico she wasn't going to Mexico for their match anyways so I thought credit to Emma Hayes for calling that out on the night as in her very subtle Emma Hayes way where it's like yeah no but it was it was good to highlight it because you know I hadn't even really twigged it I saw the pictures of the girls on their their private plane I was like god fair play and then obviously we were on the way out to an international match tonight and I was like wait those girls are in camp um so yeah again it it points to a little bit of elitism in a way that you know obviously Barcelona would be able to do that and mm. other clubs wouldn't maybe have the wherewithal um but yeah a, a good point and, and possibly one that should be made and, and fair play to Emma Hayes for making it yeah she's always great for a soundbite I'm looking forward to I'm at the FA Cup final at the weekend for Chelsea and Arsenal so we'll hopefully have a little bit of a dive into that next week um and hopefully a lot more good things from Emma Hayes to come and from Katie and from Katie McCabe in that game yeah (laughs) there were a lot of Arsenal fans being like Vera Powell take her off yeah I know (laughs) Katie wouldn't have come off in a game like that no No way not when there was a chance she could get her, her name on the score sheet again but Luckily, she came out of it unscathed, and I think that she'll again go back into um, club football, and she'll be she'll be amongst some, a lot of buzzing people in that Arsenal squad now. Some really good results across the board for their squad. Yeah, big week for them with the FA Cup final, and then Barcelona. But should be interesting. It's, it's a good it's a good time for women's football in general. There's a lot of interesting matches. There's obviously you don't want to see too many 11 nil results but I think there's a lot of good ones coming up I think Chelsea are playing Juventus as well which should be interesting Joe Montemuro obviously former Arsenal boss so he has Chelsea's measure and they have a few good results behind them in the Champions League um but now is normally the time of the podcast that we would get our claws out dig into Emma Carroll's <laughs> WSL team of the week um but with the uh, with the league on the break we thought we'd also give Emma a little bit of a break as well and all her yeah strikes. we've been we've been going in hard on her <laughs> selecting 10 strikers so, so we'll give her, yeah. give her a break from hopefully that hopefully she's um, sitting somewhere enjoying the result tonight not yeah. thinking about hope her she's warmer week. than me <laughs> <laughs> yeah but we won't be taking too much of a break because we will be back next week and she's going to do a very 
very special all-time Irish WSL uh, starting 11, which should be very, very fun. Um, if you have any suggestions, opinions, or thoughts on who should make that cut, or even just on the game tonight, who you thought played well, who you think you'd like to see more of, please get them into us on Twitter at Off the Ball using the hashtag OTB Gig, as we would absolutely love to hear them, and we will definitely feature some on the show. While we're in this international break and the WSL action takes a little bit of a pause, we thought we'd take the time to do a deep dive into one of often the most underlooked but also over-discussed aspects of the game, which is goalkeeping. And who better to do it with us than former Ireland international captain and all-round hero, Emma Byrne. Emma, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thanks for having me and thanks for the amazing intro. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time well hero. <laughs> <laughs> I put that line in. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Karen just takes this as an opportunity to compliment all the players that she can't normally do to their faces. So. <laughs> oh, I've never given so a like compliment her. to her face. No way. <laughs> It's so not like you, Carol. <laughs> Who are you? I'm changed. I'm a changed woman. I think Katie McCabe a few weeks ago was like fully shocked. She didn't know what to say when nice Karen came out to play. <laughs> yeah, it's what's, really weird. Yeah, what's weird is Karen. wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I've mellowed since my retirement. Emma. So have I believed it. Really? Yeah. I don't believe it. <laughs> um, totally. Maybe we'll save some of the good stories for later on in the podcast. We'll <laughs> ease the listeners into it. <laughs> never, never. No. We take it with us to the. <laughs> Emma, I suppose to start off with, like I kind of alluded to it a bit in the intro, but for me, anyways, I know as someone who writes about sport, women's goalkeeping is something I get asked about a lot, but by people who don't really have a whole lot of knowledge about it and kind of rely on old stereotypes and old tropes and things to start us off would you mind telling us like a little bit I suppose about your experiences and like how that became like a natural home for you and what if at any point the coaching kind of caught up with where you thought it should be for someone in your position um well actually I I got dragged in kicking and screaming into goals and I really <laughs> didn't want to go in goals because you know, when you're younger, you want to be involved and you want to run after the ball wherever it is. And when you're in goal, you're you're kind of stuck in your your 18 yard box. But I did grow to love it, obviously. Um, and with regards to coaching and stuff like that, uh, there there was none. There was no goalkeeping coach, and I don't think it's where it should be yet either. But back then, there was definitely none. We're talking about a long time ago, I know, but um. Even uh, in my days at Arsenal, we didn't have a, a full-time goalkeeping coach until my last three or four years at the club. Like after 17 years, it's a long time not having a goalkeeping coach. So yeah, it's definitely been um, a position that has been neglected 100%. And I think you can see that in the goalkeeping performances. And certainly up until about three or four years ago, you could see it. It has improved a lot because the coaching has improved a lot and certain rules and regulations within the infrastructure has um, forced clubs to get goalkeeping coaches. But um, yeah, it's, it's a huge problem, a huge problem. And when I was at Arsenal, I was basically the goalkeeping coach, which was brilliant for me. But, um, you know, I needed coaching as well. And it took asking one of the the men's coaches um I asked him if I could join in with their sessions um, and things like that so actually it was really good because I ended up training with the the under 16 boys on Saturday mornings like doing extra sessions so that was that was really cool but um yeah it was a problem and the FA then brought in um certain criterias that every club had to have a goalkeeping coach, which was crazy for me that they didn't have them, even, you know, as I said, at Arsenal. But um, I know Ireland are a little bit behind that still, and that needs to be addressed. And, you know, also, I just want to say, you can have a goalkeeping coach, but it's really difficult to get a very good goalkeeping coach. 
as I'm sure Karen will, <laughs> she, she'll back me up with my many <laughs> coaching back. coaches yeah. that I've had. I think you were coaching with. them most of the time still. So yeah, <laughs> that coaching role from Arsenal didn't change when he came back to the Irish team, I don't think too much. Yeah, and because I had such a high standard and I probably was a little bit bitter about the fact that I didn't have goalkeeping coaches, um, it was really difficult to adjust to coming from Arsenal where I had an amazing coach, uh, albeit one of the, the boys' coaches, then coming back and not having, either not having a coach or having, um, probably worse for me, to be honest, having a mediocre coach or a poor coach and uh, that was really difficult for me and I think as well like, it's interesting you say that because it's something that's definitely not limited to Ireland either I remember listening to a conversation with um Siobhan Chamberlain and Carly Telford and Carly talking about the it was on BBC a couple of months ago and Carly saying before the 2015 World Cup she had a coach who was like a 75 year old man couldn't kick the ball off the ground which you know is great for a goalkeeper <laughs> it's not like it's your distribution is important or anything that he could only volley a ball so it's something that has been across the game but in that conversation they were saying that they felt like that position coaching wise whatever about women's football being behind because of the lack of funding and everything else over the years that that position particularly was probably about 10 to 15 years behind others when it came to coaching when it came to positional awareness when it came to just even like diet wise everything is that something that you would agree with absolutely um you know it's still lacking if you ask me a little bit and I was lucky because I was playing other sports. So actually the other sports that I was playing kind of allowed me to perform for, for soccer. And a lot of players don't have that. I was playing a lot of badminton. I was playing at a high level. So I was getting all my footwork through my coaching in badminton. And then I was playing a lot of Gaelic football. I was playing for Kildare. So I was getting that aspect of it in, in that way. So when I came into training at the weekends with the Irish team, um, I was probably a little bit ahead because of that than the other goalkeepers. So I think that was really important for me. And I always encourage young goalkeepers to do other sports as well. But um, yeah, like I think it is worse for me getting a coach or it was, I'm, I'm not playing anymore. I have to remember that. Uh, it was worse for me when I was literally like just shoved in and, and a coach was there just to kind of, you know, to, to, to fill a space type of thing. And, and I, I know I was, I've probably been a little bit rough on a lot of goalkeeping coaches in my career, but um, I felt like it was justified because if you're playing at a top level, you need a top coach and it is so specific. Um, you can't just get the, the groundsman to come over and warm you up or someone's parents or, or just a, an ordinary coach, to be quite honest, even if they are top level coaches, you have to be specifically a goalkeeping coach. Yeah, and I and, think you um, need to keep hammering that because we're, you're gone a while now and we still haven't replaced you. We're still having the debate on the Irish team as to who the number one is because we haven't got someone who was at your level and you got it from different places. So maybe their coaching, even growing up, still wasn't like reaching those things that you were getting from other sports. Yeah. You were just somewhat fortunate that you grew up with other sports and were encouraged in that way. I also think there's only a handful of really good goalkeeping coaches. And that's in England and Ireland. Mm. And I was lucky enough to have probably the best in the world, as far as I'm concerned, with Alex Welch at Arsenal. And I didn't mind having to go you know, to the other, another part of London to get my training because it was, every minute was worth it. Whereas, uh, and not only coaching, he was a psychologist as well. And for me, that was very important. And it is for goalkeeping. It's the psychology around goalkeeping. And um, it's about when you make mistakes, who's going to pick you up. And I don't care what anyone says, goalkeeping is not a part of the team. It's a part from the team. And when you make mistakes, you can really feel that. You don't feel a part of the team. It's your mistake. It's an individual error. And you need a psychologist as in a coach that has that kind of mentality or those skills to pick you up. And, and that's really important. And a lot of coaches don't have that. What was it in particular, I suppose, I suppose even like Karen, you've mentioned it there, like in an Irish context, obviously we've seen 
over this past few campaigns, there has been a few quite big mistakes which have hampered us quite badly when it comes to qualifying and different matches. But what were the things for you personally, Emma, that like really helped in those bad, if, well, I'm not, obviously if those moments aren't referring to you, but in times where you had that journey. I had love. Through, I had yeah. love those moments. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what were the sort of things that you were hearing from your coach that were taking you through it? Like how, what was the psychology that went into it? Um, well, also my Alex, uh, Arsenal was, he was a coach mentor, which was a massive thing as well, because he was basically coaching me how to coach. And he was given, he was, every session was about dealing with these things, but how I would pick a younger goalkeeper up if they made these mistakes. And of course, I didn't realize it at the time, but he was probably aiming it at me, but not directly. <laughs> He's very, very clever. You're He's too afraid terrible. to say it to your face anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it's all about, you know, being competent. Competent comes before confidence and sometimes the training sessions aren't about that they're about the coach and how many they can score and if they look good and how they've done in the session when they're not really thinking about the goalkeeper uh, and you know not focusing on them and how not scoring goals on them is how they can save the goals and that all comes down to the service as well which is another <laughs> problem um for some coaches they don't have the skill and the technique to, to feed the ball and this is a massive thing and one of my um Alex's favorite phrase was um poor feeding stars the practice I have to think about that one. poor feeding <laughs> stars the practice and he was the the king of phrases by the way and it really is true because it's all connected to how your goalkeeper develops and how they feel after a training session so when I was playing and I made a mistake I could diagnose the mistake. I knew what I did wrong. I knew what I had to do to correct it. And then I practice it in, in training. So you're constantly correcting it, not just because you want to correct your technique, but mentally as well, which is probably the biggest thing. Um, so you know you can do it. It's a case, okay, it was a mistake. You don't become a bad goalkeeper overnight. You just go and you train and then you get it right the next time. And I also had very good players around me. So that really helped. And particularly with the Irish team, because there was such a good camaraderie and it was a really nice atmosphere. You never felt like you were on your own because, you know, everyone made mistakes and they made you feel that way as well. So that obviously built my confidence as well. Who in particular are you mentioning there now, Emma? Um, not you, Karen. <laughs> obviously I'm not, not going to give you the confidence. <laughs> I wasn't no, of course, it anyway. of course you, Karen. Yeah, of course. Everyone, but everyone. you've you've played like for such a long period. You had like such. You saw all the kind of generations up to this point, um. And people always talk about how much improvements there's been over the years. But is there anything from the first ten years of playing that you think is a little bit missing from the current crop, or you think that the current crop could learn from, or do you think it's all been positive? Um. No, I don't think it's positive. I think it's a really sad state of affairs, to be quite honest, because, well, it's sad the fact that if you're saying that I haven't been replaced, I, I'm not going to agree with that. But I think it's really sad that that's the case. I mean, I'm retired over four years now, and especially coming from a country where Gaelic sports are so prominent, we should be able to have get a goalkeeper from this because they have all the skills and the attributes to be a goalkeeper. And I think it's re it's a real shame that we're not producing goalkeepers. So then you have to look at what we're doing to develop our goalkeepers. And are we doing enough? Are there specific goalkeeping sessions? Is the criteria for every single women's team to have a goalkeeping coach? No, it's not. And um, I think that know, that's really obvious from the fact that, well, the girls, are, they, there are good goalkeepers in there at the moment, but they are all English born goalkeepers in the current squad. So we do really have to look at what's happening in, in Ireland. Mm -hmm. I've said it all along. I mean, not just for goalkeeping, for the development of women's football, I really believe there should be an academy and uh, education based. Obviously, that's a massive thing. Not just any old education, a really good education, because mm -hmm. you have a lot of academies that you can only do specific subjects and it's kind of average schools. 
I think it, there needs to be an academy that they can get their education that they want and train every day and have good coaches in those academies as well, I have to emphasize. And they're developing them, even if it's a goalkeeping academy, it doesn't have to be specific mm. goalkeeping, because one of the one things that I do have to talk about is the fitness levels of the goalkeeper. And personally, I think a goalkeeper has to be even more of an athlete than an outfield player. And I'm not sure that that message is is getting through to some of the goalkeepers because, I mean, I was a bit of a freak when I was younger about stuff like that because I wanted to be super fit. I wanted to be the fittest. I wanted to get rid of that. You know, everyone thought the goalkeeper was always, you know, the one that couldn't run and the least athletic I wanted to get rid of that and I think I did for for a little bit especially with Arsenal and things like that so I worked really hard outside of training to do that and I'm not sure the goalkeepers are doing that you know also in fairness to them they're not getting the training and the very specific things about their agility training it's not the same as the outfielders they need to have specific programs and that needs to be done at an earlier age than 20, 25. That needs to happen when they're 15, 16, even, I mean, earlier if possible. So yeah, it's, it's a big thing that needs to be changed and there's a lot of work that has to go into it and you just need someone to want to do it. And I'm hoping that they will do it (laughs) because I think it's fairly obvious and we're, we're falling behind with that, which I think it's another sad thing because the, yes, the goalkeeping is improving, but it's improving more rapidly in other countries than our own. And that's something that I never thought I would see either, but you know, that can be changed. It's good that players are going to professional clubs and getting that training. I don't know what their training is like. I've asked a couple of goalkeepers before they said they were happy. That for me doesn't really mean anything uh, you know every goalkeeping coach should be assessed and unfortunately some uh, outfield coaches don't know what it takes to be a good goalkeeping coach so they're not being assessed properly and they might be only being assessed with by the goalkeeper's performance and I'm not sure that we that, that those performances have been good enough. Mm-hmm. I think it's interesting you say about like other countries going ahead because I interviewed um, Ellie Roebuck who obviously plays for England and City god must be probably got to be a year ago now and she's probably the first of that generation who have had that sort of goalkeeping coaching from that very very young age all the way up and just talking about her with her about it the maturity that she had compared to a lot of other people I had interviewed and the things she knew and obviously being at City is a massive bump as well because she was able to work with people like Ederson who like again one of the best goalkeepers in the world on the men's side and have access to those coaches so I suppose from an Irish standpoint to see the FA across the water doing that from a young age it's so easy to see how it could be replicated or something that we could tap into because it's just there yeah I mean it is difficult for for RFA to do it but whereas in, in England they have the clubs Elio has been with Man City the club has done that more than anything and the club have provide has provided the goalkeeping coaches and and then it's down to the to the player to the goalkeeper to to push for that like Ellie pushes for for what she wants and yeah. she's very very determined and she knows she's had good good goalkeeping coach so she knows what she wants and she knows what she doesn't want in in, in reference to goalkeeping coaches and but she also can um tap into the fai fa resources uh, in the uk if she wants extra sessions she can go to george's park and get them so there are lots of options for the goalkeepers in england and um and and the clubs themselves tend specifically Man City will tend to mix the coaches with the boys and the girls and they allow the girls access to those coaches which is fantastic which I'm not sure they do in Ireland very much I don't know maybe you can answer that better than me (laughs) (laughs) um no because even at the moment we're the women's national league is is pretty separate to the men's league of Ireland so you the girls are all being asked to go and find their own boys training like Vera's harping on no you need to find boys training boys training they're still not being given 
that help in hand, like if the FAI aren't going to provide that training, can they at least be the link or, or find those coaches? Um, because it is hard for the girls to just kind of rock up to boys coaches and say, oh, can I help? You're saying they, they should do that. And if they want to reach the next level, they will. But maybe for you need them doing it at a young age and maybe they're just not confident in themselves enough to do no, that i wouldn't have done that yeah i wouldn't have done exactly that yeah no so chance. it just takes initiative it's going to take someone within there to recognize okay looking at it at the moment looking at our national team we've got good goalkeepers they're all english born that let's do something in ireland let's try and address it and it is something simple like that like creating these links and using yeah. the best coaches that you can yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, straight away, there should be, I mean, it could be a, a, a union, goalkeepers union, <laughs> but you have your coaches and they can be traveling. It can be from the FAI. They can travel to the big clubs and, and put on sessions and they can do it regularly. I don't see why they can't do that. The problem is, are they good enough to coach uh, the women's league? Because the women's league is the top league in, in Ireland. You can't just have a random goalkeeping coach go in. They have to be very, very good. And I mean, maybe that's changed since I've been there, but I know there weren't enough when I was there. Um, maybe well, I think the first good. thing is that they're not getting enough training. And then the second thing is, is the coach good enough? I think that both of those things would need to be looked at. I don't think they're getting enough home-based training at the moment, from my point of view. They're asking the clubs to do more and more, but the clubs are still amateur. So um I think there's definitely a gap there for, first of all, getting more training, just that's the first basic step. And then obviously mm. improving that training. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I agree with you in some way, but again, like if I'm, for example, when I was playing and I had a goalkeeping coach that I'm like, this man is <laughs> or a woman or could it be either, <laughs> whatever he's doing my head in because he's not good enough. I don't want to see him every day I don't want to see him three times a week because he's he's rubbish and I'm wasting my time and I'm getting more and more frustrated with it so you have a catch-22 yes they need to they need training they need fitness they need well outfield training as well I always included myself in the outfield training because they need to be as good with their feet and then they also need specific goalkeeping training. So in actual fact, the goalkeepers are probably the hardest workers on the pitch. I mean, I've always said <laughs> it, but <laughs> just to emphasize that again. But this is, they could do what I did. I did my training with Arsenal and we trained every day. And then I went on a Thursday night. I only went training with Alex twice a week. Mm -hmm. I went on a Thursday night for, with him two hours and a Saturday morning with him two hours. I would I would have wanted more, but at the time that's all that was available and it was OK. I mean, that would be better than than probably what they're getting at the moment. And that is definitely feasible. You can definitely have six sessions around the country that people can get to. If they're like Ellie Roebuck, they will get there no matter what. <laughs> And, and you could do that twice a week. And that's only going to be a handful of goalkeeping coaches. Surely you have them in Ireland. You find them. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Emma, are you going to lead the revolution to find these goalkeeping coaches that are strangely missing from the setup at the moment? <laughs> well, another um, amazing thing is that Alex Welch, my, my hero, he's a hero, mm -hmm. um, was also a coach educator so he kind of ran the London educational uh, program to become a coach so I did my coaching badges with him and I was just shocked to see the amount of people coming in the door that had no idea about how to coach a goalkeeper whether they were doing their level two whether they were doing their B even their A I was really surprised how little knowledge they had. And some of them had the knowledge, but they just didn't know how to, to, to coach it. So you can have your A license, um, you have the certificate and you can go and coach. And it doesn't mean you're a good coach. It means you've passed the test. And that's not the same thing. <laughs> it's not the same thing. So what I got from Alex was obviously the knowledge on, of goalkeeping, but also how to coach and the different ways that you coach a goalkeeper. And 
that was a massive thing and um, a massive advantage as well for anybody who did their badges with Alex because it was a real eye opener for a lot of them, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Emma, this has been so interesting. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Um, I know I've learned a lot. I'm sure all our listeners have as well. And hopefully we'll get you back again sometime soon. Thanks for having me. And Carol, when are you coming back? No. Hurl her on the dish <laughs> no. now, Emma. Hurl her on the dish. What would I come back and do? She gets this every week. So I you, can, it you can sit in that holding position. You don't even have to run. They already have two girls in there in their five, three, two stupid formation. They have plenty of girls. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't be saying that. <laughs> <laughs> There's no space for me in there now. There's a there's that space is waiting for you just in front of Neve and Louise, right there. Yeah, it was a nice triangle back in the day, but look, let the kids let the kids off now. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. Have a good one. It was a lovely to talk to you, Matt. Cheers. Thanks, Emma. That is us for this week's Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports in association with Cabri FC, official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland's women's national team. Thanks so much to Emma Byrne for giving us her time this week and enlightening us on all the ways and woes of goalkeeping. It was so interesting. I, I felt like I learned a lot and Emma was also just generally very good crack. I really enjoyed chatting to her. Karen and I will be back as usual next Tuesday and we'll have that very, very special all-time Irish WSL team with Emma Carroll. And don't forget to get all your thoughts and opinions, suggestions into us on Twitter at Off The Ball using the hashtag OTB Koi Gig. It's been a massive week for Irish football. I hope everyone has enjoyed it as much as we have. Uh, I think this has possibly been the most fun I've had recording the show. Yeah, and I hope <laughs> the least stressful. <laughs> yeah, and I hope it will continue into many weeks ahead. Um, so I hope you can all calm down. Karen, I hope you'll warm up. And thank you so much for joining me. The Koi Gig Pod and OTB Sports in association with Cadbury. A player and a half deserves a glass and a half of support.